Hi, everybody. Hopefully you've been enjoying the uh, sessions as I have uh, over the, the last couple of hours. Um, the last one was a, a great discussion of the divergent perspectives on uh, micro-credentials. Uh, and I think it's a good segue to what um, my colleague Wendy and I are going to talk about for the next 30 minutes. Um, but first, uh, I'm, Wendy, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Sure. My name is Wendy Sukir. I lead the Diversity Institute at Ryerson University. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm the research lead for the Future Skills Centre, which is what uh, sponsored this particular project. But I also lead the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub and a couple of other uh, initiatives. And I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Chippewa, and the Mississauga of the Credit. And all of our work is really framed in, um, in a commitment to truth and reconciliation, but also to creating um, diverse and inclusive workplaces and classrooms. That's amazing, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I have the great pleasure of knowing Wendy for quite some time. Uh, we've had the opportunity to do a lot of work together over the years, uh, and I must say, uh, I'm, I'm, I learn a lot from you, Wendy, uh, always, and I always appreciate uh, the approach that you take to, um, well, to equity and inclusion uh, broadly, but also to how we can work together as communities to ensure access uh, to education, uh, you know, more broadly. And I think that's a great kind of uh, segue to talk about um, what we're here to talk about today, which is the future is micro. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat, um, which will take you over to our Twitter, uh, which actually gives you a link directly to this report that Wendy and I and many others have been working on uh, over the past year and a bit. Um, we're really pleased to be here today to not just to release this report, The Future is Micro, Digital Learning and Micro Credentials for Education Retraining and Lifelong Learning, uh, but to spend a little bit of time talking about what this means, uh, what micro-credentials mean, and what we've talked about in the report. Um, this is a collaboration between the Diversity Institute, the Future Skills Centre, Magnet, and eCampus Ontario, um, which you can uh, read about in the report. And uh, we took a, a relatively unique approach, but to try, and in the spirit of what we're talking about here today, uh, to, to talk about uh, putting micro-credentials in practice, we looked at the practice of micro-credentials in Ontario. We related that to some of the other issues that are coming uh, both nationally and internationally, mostly around uh, the definition. And we land on a few uh, recommendations, eight in fact, um, where we uh, talk about some of the things that we as a community can do to really advance uh, the state of micro-credentials, um, primarily because um, I guess this is the, the spoiler alert, uh, we believe that they're good for uh, access uh, to education and to careers. And I think that's a great framing for what we'll talk about today. Um, so we're going to spend the next you know, 20 or so minutes. Uh, I've got a few questions for Wendy, so I'm going to uh, interview her so that you all have the benefit of, uh, of some uh, good thoughts on uh, micro-credentials. Uh, and I'll encourage you to put some questions in the, uh, the Q&A, um, and I will answer these. I won't answer them, actually. I'll field them as they come in, and uh, we'll answer them together. Um, so as I said, uh, today we're releasing the report, The Future is Micro. You've got the link there. Uh, the report covers the work we did together to uncover some best practices around micro-credentials in practice and their more broader relationship to education, upskilling, reskilling, retraining, and also lifelong learning. So maybe I'll just start with a basic question, Wendy, and you can tell me, why do you think micro-credentials are important? So thanks very much for the, the question, Robert, and, and thank you for all your work, because uh, certainly um, the work eCampus Ontario has done in this uh, is really uh, leading us, I think, nationally and, and internationally in some ways um, to uh, move from the theory to, to practical action. And I know over the last few years, you've played a really instrumental role in, in 
not just moving the ideas forward, but actually supporting the development of micro-credentials in the province with post-secondary institutions and employers. So we can, we can, um, we can move this, uh, this forward. And from my point of view, the, the, you know, and I've worked since my very early career at Ryerson in uh, continuing education and, and uh, other kinds of professional development, dealing with um, often underrepresented groups, transitions to employment and so on. And in my mind, micro-credentials offer pathways into post-secondary but also pathways from post-secondary to employment. And I can give you, you know, a couple of examples. I'm, I'm on the board of an organization called NPower, which focuses on training marginalized youth for um, uh, high demand entry level information technology jobs. Now, a lot of these youth are um, did not have success even in, in graduating from uh, secondary school, let alone post-secondary school. But once they have uh, the experience of learning and some of these very concrete certifications in, in technology under their belt, suddenly they're developing confidence and different experiences with learning than they had maybe when they were, uh, were younger. And many of them are very interested in moving as they advance in their careers then into post-secondary. So I see that as one of the examples where micro-credentials are sort of bite-sized pieces of, of um, learning that can be stacked in order to help create pathways in. And many post-secondary institutions, colleges as well as universities, have these, um, have mechanisms in place to allow this and have for many years. And then of course the other the other piece is the pathways out. And here, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, the, the idea that if you can afford it, you should study what you love. And, you know, I studied uh, Renaissance and medieval history and spent a lot of time immersed in Shakespeare. And I don't ever regret that. I then, you know, did an MBA and some other stuff. But what we've seen with some of the micro-credential programs we've been involved in is and, and the ones that I'm especially excited about are where you have a student who studied history or English or philosophy or one of the one of the areas that is generally re regarded as not providing a pathway to um, to employment and you can you can let people study what they want but then you can put them through an educational experience, maybe coupled with work integrated learning and help them transition into a, a great career. And, you know, I'm like B.F. Skinner, I experimented on my child. She, she did a master's degree in painting at Parsons and she now earns as much money as I do at BCG. And I think she would, she would attest to the value of, of having short bite-sized um, learning experiences that helped her make that transition. So, I mean, a good couple of things come to mind. You've nicely uh, addressed some of the issues that I heard come up in the previous panel, which I would summarize as the difference between transactional and transformational goals of education. And it sounds to me like they can be both. I, and I would agree with you. I think they can be both. Um, Alex Escher wrote a column uh, many years ago when he said that all education has been geared towards uh, supporting career preparation. It's just that universities were first set up to support the clergy and uh, that's what they were, uh, they were done. And the, his point, I think I'm paraphrasing, but humanities and social sciences uh, degrees in particular were set up to support the public service and because that's what you need uh, in the public service. So. I mean, people like Alex Usher, I guess, would say that uh, all education has always been transactional, i.e. it leads to a job or a career, and it, and it um, is also transformational because it leads you to be inculcated into the norms of society. And that kind of leads me to a question that came up when you're talking about, you know, pathways in for people who are traditionally marginalized. And, and I'm wondering, so micro-credentials, we heard a lot, I've heard a lot, certainly, and we've addressed this in our report about the, uh, the need or how micro-credentials are disrupting traditional mods, models or modes 
of education. I'm wondering, like, is there a correlation or is it causal, causal between that disruption? So these traditional models of education have not enabled historically marginalized people to access post-secondary education. And now, you know, we have a route in for it, so micro-credentials. So I'm wondering, like, is that a correlation or, or is, it, is, it, is it just a, a happenstantial connection? You know, hard, hard to hard to say definitively because as you as we've talked about, um, I feel like I should call you grasshopper because <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you know I've been around for a very long time. But you know, micro credentials aren't actually new. It's just that technology has enabled them to be more widely accessible, and they've um, technology has supported the credentialing piece. But we've always had. Uh, non-credit programs and certifications and and all kinds of other things. And so mm. in my mind, it's not such a big departure from what we've had for a long time. It's perhaps more the scale and the fact that some employers are, it's true, bypassing uh, post-secondary credentials as the only pathway in. But there's some really good reasons for doing that. And if you look at, for instance, um, uh, one of my favorite organizations, Jelly Academy out of BC, uh, which is Indigenous led and serves primarily Indigenous youth, provides industry certifications in a variety of technology areas related to digital marketing that helps kids get jobs who otherwise would be um, working in survival um, jobs. So. And these are, are good, good, well-paid positions. So from my point of view, you know, back to your point about the, um, the role of education, let's not ignore the, the very strong class base of uh, socioeconomic base of the idea that you could study anything and then you would ride a horse on your, on your estate and there's been a real shift in in our in our um, in the populations that want a post secondary education, and many of them don't have the uh, connections and the social capital needed to get those jobs, regardless of what they study. So I think that's a reality today that's very different from. Um, when perhaps I was in I was in university where any degree was a, a pathway to employment. That's simply not the case today. Right. And I think we have to recognize there are a lot, 50% of, of uh, uh, sorry, black youth in the GTA have, have graduated high, from high school 50% the rate of others. 90% of them would like to go to post-secondary education, but only half of them think they can. And so we have to really grapple with the fundamental inequality, um, I think, in in terms of post-secondary education in particular. I, I really like the approach that you're taking uh, to uh, like access uh, and, and looking at education or micro-credentials as an on-road to education, but also the point that you made about, um, you know, I guess the on-ramp, off-ramp into a career off of education onto career, uh, particularly for those who lack the social capital to get the, the job or the career they want. And, and one of the recommendations in our report is to drive awareness of the micro-credential potential and opportunity. And, you know, certainly we, we don't shy away from the fact that there are some, uh, some downsides that we have to account for. Um, but so driving awareness of micro-credential potential and opportunity across Canada among stakeholder groups identified in the report, educators, employers, and learners. And I'm wondering if you could comment on, like, what do you think some of the best ways are to achieve this? Well, I think for me, one of the big issues, and I'm in an awkward position. I am in a business school. <laughs> I am part of the evil corporate empire, but I am passionate, passionate about um, preserving arts and social sciences as a discipline um, and I, I fight at every opportunity any suggestions that you know all kids need to study engineering computer science and, and business so I'm passionate about allowing people to study what they love and what they what they want to do 
And I think that one of the biggest challenges we have, and I've been on those panels, is within post-secondary institutions, there seem to be people who really believe that anything that prepares someone for a job is inherently wrong, <laughs> unless that job is working at a university because they have never worked anywhere other than universities. And I think that that is really wrong-minded. So I think the first thing we have to do is, is help people understand, in my view, in post-secondary institutions that micro-credentials are not actually a threat to what we're teaching or what we want to teach. They are something that will help students get jobs. And while many of us maybe went to school when that wasn't a big issue because if you had a post-secondary education, you would get a job. I think we have to grapple with the fact that a lot of university graduates are underemployed. And so, you know, this is something that helps students. And, and so I think that's very important for universities to understand. I think that when it comes to employers, one of the things that becomes very important is ensuring that the micro-credentials actually mean something. Because right now there is a lot of um, churn in the market. There are a lot of competing platforms. You know, I personally can issue a micro-credential because you came to four sessions where I talked at you about diversity. Doesn't mean you've learned anything, doesn't mean you can do anything. But there is, right now we do have some issues around what a micro-credential actually means. But in addition to addressing that, I think we need to get employers to engage more actively with post-secondary institutions to ensure that where the post-secondary institutions are offering micro-credentials, it's not for imaginary jobs, it's for real jobs. And mm -hmm. you know, Robert, that I feel very strongly that there's some really interesting um, ways in which you can combine micro-credentials and work integrated learning and help people transition. Mm -hmm. uh, into employment. So I think that work needs to be done. But I also think that, you know, I, I feel like we've uh, kind of lost the narrative on, um, on, uh, on, on learning assessment and giving people credit for things that they didn't necessarily learn in the, in the classroom. We used to have a lot more mm -hmm. innovative programs where you could channel, challenge credits and things like that. And I think universities need to really be, especially in colleges as well, really need to be considering the stackability and the prior learning assessments and how they can recognize these industry um, uh, credentials as counting towards other kinds of post-secondary credentials. Because at the end of the day, you know, I think that uh, uh, graduates need jobs, and many of them also want post-secondary uh, credentials. It's true. Uh, in my years, decades, and two and a half decades of working in the university and college sector, I've never met a student who didn't want a career. Even if that career was to be a student, they, they still wanted to have a job. Um, so I think that's, that's really nicely put. Um, at, uh, we had a keynote that uh, spoke this morning, Tara Lachlan, um, who, I'm going to get this wrong, uh, talked about, I, I really enjoyed it. It was about like what lies below, below the surface of the water, like an iceberg in terms of skills. And she talked about prior learning assessment, uh, VSBL, visible, stackable bits of learning. I think it was, uh, somebody can correct me in the chat if I'm wrong on that. Um, but she, she was talking about how they, they do um, use human-centered design methods uh, to help people to design programs that help people do that kind of uh, assessment. Um, so it, it is a bit of a change, I suppose. And so maybe what we're talking about here is that micro credentials, not necessarily new, although digital platforms are new, are an avenue for us to start rethinking some of the basic, basic assumptions of education as we start to encourage more openness and access. I can give you one concrete example. I do a lot of work with the Black Business Professional Association, and we know that in general, as I explained, Black students have not good experiences in K-12, to and that inhibits pathways to post-secondary. And um, the Black Business Professional Association with York University has been running a financial literacy course on, on Saturday mornings, I think 10 to 12 or something. And they get 150 
160 people coming to 13 weeks of classes on basically what we would teach in our BCom in Introduction to Finance. And I look at that and I think, why don't we have a way of saying, if you do this exam, and the exam would be, you know, set in, in uh, uh, compatibly with the existing credit courses, if you do this exam, we'll give you a university credit. And then if you want to do a couple more courses, we'll give you a business certificate. And then, you know, and this is how Ryerson grew its continuing education. Right. You get, you start to stack these, these, these credentials, whether they're micro or more traditional things, mm -hmm. and eventually you too can have a degree. Like I'm always thrilled when I see people who are 80 years old graduating from university. And I think that we have lost sight of, of how transformational access to education is. And we, we need to recreate some of those pathways that make it more accessible for people. Right, that's well said. Um, we have about eight or so minutes left. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to Chris Bylerjean, who indeed says it's verifiable, stackable bits of learning, VSBL, so visible, um, which is uh, quite well done. Um, and just uh, open the floor for uh, any questions uh, that we might want to ask, not that anybody has had a chance to read the report uh, mm -hmm. at this point. Um, but certainly, I mean, we feel that we've covered a lot of the, uh, in the report, uh, a lot of the ground that is being discussed around micro-credentials and indeed at this forum and that you've talked a lot about, you know, the need for a robust employer and educator uh, engagement, uh, for example, which is one of the ways to, uh, to foster uh, like the, the career entry. Um, some of the other recommendations we have are about conducting further research into assessment methods. So that's, I guess, partly uh, you're inferring from um, like prior learning assessment, for instance, and ways in which we can start to open up the, uh, put a drawbridge over the moat of, uh, of learning, I guess, to use, uh, uh, to use the metaphor. But maybe um, we could talk briefly about digital platforms and, and digital transformation, because you've talked a bit about this. And I know that you've run a program called ADAPT, which is about acquiring uh, digital skills you mentioned a little bit earlier. I also read a report from the Future Skills Center that talked about the need for more and better digital skills in Canadians that that we're we're not doing a great job of of teaching digital skills. Uh, the last panel talked about how employers are under investing in continuing education. We invested about 30 percent the rate of the United States, I believe it is. Um, so like our micro credentials, one of the ways, are they a way or, or say, I mean, I think they are a way, but how, how are micro credentials a way to help to address things like digital transformation? You know, it's interesting because it was one of the big things that we did talk about and I forgot to mention. So we talk about pathways into post-secondary pathways into employment. And then of course, the big opportunity is also for upskilling and reskilling. Mm -hmm. And we know, and we've known for quite a long time that continuous learning is, is critical to, it's not just about getting a job, it's about keeping jobs, rate of transformation, all those things, you know, now we've, we're putting a big focus on green skills because that's becoming a big issue. And micro-credentials, there is very good evidence to suggest that, of course, employees will, will engage in professional development activities, but giving them micro-credentials adds incentive to actually completing because one of the biggest problems we have with online self-paced learning is attrition and mm -hmm. if there is a path if there is a badge or a micro credential it makes a massive difference we're working with the the Ismaili council on pre-arrival training for afghan refugees in camps and they are working through basic skills for success basic literacy basic numeracy and the evidence is those little badges those little markers of progress Mm -hmm. actually help keep people moving. There are other things you have to do as well. But I think from an employer perspective, you know, AT&T invested a billion dollars in reskilling 50% of its workforce. Um, there's no question that it's going to be a massive uh, undertaking. And this is one way to advance collaboration between post-secondary institutions and employers 
to help keep workforces current. Mm -hmm. Well said. I've been reading the book Nudge uh, recently. Um, actually, I think I read it before, but they put out a latest edition, so I'm reading it again. And so it's a great read. Um, but they make the point in there that uh, learning done incrementally and with, um, I don't use the term reward, but with those kind of markers, milestone markers, as you put it, uh, leads to better, not like sticky knowledge uh, and uh, more effective investment. So in some respects, this, this move to disaggregation into micro-credentials um, is a great way to, to support this effective investment in learning. And, you know, speaking of newcomers, I mean, we're, we're the, uh, the, uh, uh, the settlement of Afghan refugees, which I know you've been af uh, very active in, is, is, a, is a key thing that we need to be doing uh, with the country. We're seeing uh, more refugees come out of the, the, the war in Europe now. Uh, so it's, it is a pretty key way for us to, uh, I guess, answer the, the problem of how to, how to ensure that people, when they're coming here, we value and validate the skills they have and we give them the ability to move into, into employment as quickly as possible. Absolutely. And, and we've had some amazing success with uh, Pathways for Newcomers, you know, because it's, it's apocryphal, but it's true. We have engineers, computer scientists uh, driving cab. 40% of internationally educated engineers, in spite of all the screaming about the skill shortage, are stuck in survival jobs. And, and having micro credentials as opposed to sending them for, you know, big, big, long um, bridging programs, micro credentials in hot areas that, you know, Pega systems or, or data analytics or user experience is a very quick way mm -hmm. to get them, you know, out of Uber and into, uh, into the jobs commensurate with their skills. So I, I've got lots of evidence that in that regard they work really well it's really i think really good point to to reinforce and maybe um wendy given you know the the work that you do on a regular basis um like a, a good way to to end is to reinforce how you know just maybe speak a little bit how micro credentials can help us enhance and encourage diversity and inclusion but I would also add innovation to that. Yeah, well, I think I've given you, I've given you the examples. You know, you want women in technology. I've worked for 30 years on trying to increase the percentage of women in computer science and engineering, and I'm an abject failure. There, there are fewer women in computer science and only marginally more in engineering today. And we need a very concerted strategy to do that. But one of the huge opportunities, given the actual nature of digital jobs, is use micro-credentials to help women who have graduated more likely in arts and social sciences to, to transition into digital careers. I gave you the example of Jelly Academy, which focuses on transitioning Indigenous youth into, into well-paid jobs, and there are a number of different models there. When we think about newcomers, many of whom are racialized, you know, it, it seems to me to be patently obvious that where we have barriers to traditional pathways and opportunities, micro-credentials can really unlock um, many of those doors. So from, to my mind, it's a, it's a fabulous um, opportunity and we just need more coordination and sharing and, and you know, I, I respect <laughs> My, my colleagues who, who say that they don't believe that universities should be the handmaidens to corporations. I don't disagree with that, but we shouldn't be blocking opportunities for students to add to what they are studying in order to increase their employment um, chances. But Wendy, that's a, that's a great note to end on and, and, a, and a nice synopsis of what we're talking about in the report uh, and kind of rounding out the recommendations about the need for uh, more research on their uh, skills, assessment, competencies, uh, their receptivity, um, but also feedback uh, from learners and employers and how we can cohere the ecosystem, which is what we talk about to say, uh, and I'll drive this back to the, the theme of this conference, which is micro-credentials in practice, which is to say that, as to, your, to paraphrase you, we've always had them, 
they're here. We're just calling them something different maybe now, uh, but let's get on with uh, enacting them because we've got important issues to address uh, like inclusion and access to education and careers. Uh, so Wendy, uh, I want to say thank you very much for joining us and also for the uh, working with you and your teams on uh, on the work. It was really fantastic. I encourage everybody to have a look at the report. It's a great addition uh, to the uh, to the literature on micro credentials uh, and resonant with the theme of micro credentials in practice. Uh, so with that, we have a five minute break uh, and we'll return at 440 for the next session. Thank you. <laughs>